good afternoon. My name is Talha Köse. Uh, I am the director of Seta Brussels office. Uh, so we try to bring fresh issues, fresh uh, debates uh, about uh, the EU and EU-Turkey relations and other strategic issues. Uh, so one of the key issues that uh, European actors and uh, the, the people, strategic actors in Turkey have been discussing in the last couple of days especially uh, is the current tension between uh, US, EU uh, and Russia. Of course, this issue has broader background and uh, a decade uh, old uh, issue uh, and we can go even uh, further. Uh, so, in general, uh, we have also been working on uh, EU-Russia uh, relations. And uh, one of our researchers, uh, Vishne Korkmaz, drafted a report uh, about the future of EU-Russia uh, relations, so which gives a broader uh, view. And uh, Amanda Paul is also an expert on uh, Russia uh, and Ukraine. So today we're going to discuss both broader uh, agenda of EU-Russia relations, what role can Turkey uh, play in this uh, game and how these strategic relations may change in the future. And of course, Biden's presidency is, is an important issue. And uh, we will also discuss the current uh, escalation of uh, the tensions in Donbass region and Europe's uh, overall response to uh, this crisis. So what can, uh, you know, international actors uh, respond? You know, what can they do? And what may be the possible scenarios? So today we will uh, briefly discuss these uh, issues. Uh, so we have uh, very two important uh, speakers uh, today. Uh, Vishne Korkmaz and Amanda Paul. Uh, so I will uh, first of all give floor to uh, Vishne Korkmaz. Uh, she will give a broader picture uh, about EU-Russia relations, you know, problematic areas and potential for uh, cooperation. Uh, I would like to give a brief, brief uh, you know, information uh, about uh, Vishne. Uh, so she's a, a professor at uh, Nishantashi uh, University. Uh, she has uh, been also vice director of uh, Center for Mediterranean Security. Uh, she has given uh, lectures in many universities. Uh, she has drafted a book about uh, you know uh, new geopolitical realities for Russia from Black Sea to Mediterranean. So her interest areas are related to, um, you know, Black Sea politics, Russian uh, geopolitics. Uh, and uh, recently she has been also working on uh, EU-Russia relations and uh, Eastern Mediterranean uh, dimension. So she will touch on her uh, recent uh, analysis and also reflect on the current issue. Vishnojan, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Talha. Uh, I want to thank, first of all, to you and Seta for to invite me for uh, to this uh, very timely uh, panel uh, related to future of EU Russian relations. Uh, of course, we are passing um, a crisis period uh, in terms of bilateral relations. Uh, specifically, the Ukrainian crisis can be accepted a kind of cherry on the top uh, of the ice cream. Uh, if uh, I'm, uh, I want, if uh, I wish to use uh, more soft terms uh, to this crisis, um, uh, maybe I should start with a, a kind of, uh, not correction, but reminder, the book uh, that you mentioned is actually uh, edited by uh, Nurshin Hoca, Nurshin Ateşoğlu Güney. She um, uh, thought that uh, this last crisis between uh, Russia and the West on Ukrainian issue uh, can be accepted a kind of deterrence by punishment, uh, within deterrence by punishment logic. And uh, uh, 
I actually argue with her about this because I uh, took the side more deterrence by a denial logic. So uh, nevertheless, it doesn't matter whether it is deterrence by denial or deterrence by punishment. It is related to the current um, uh, situation between uh, uh, the current stalemate between European actors, which because uh, they have no enough uh, incentive and power to change, to create any kind of modification in the behaviors and in the habits of Moscow in the neighborhood of uh, Europe. And also it is related to um, certain ambiguities uh, about Biden's presidency's impact uh, uh, in the neighborhood of Europe again, uh, in terms of uh, how uh, West um, adapt uh, policies uh, to balance Russian influence there. Uh, the uh, panel title is actually a very interesting business as usual model question mark, uh, because this model uh, is uh, usually taken or referred as one of the uh, traditional uh, framework of the relations between European uh, EU, European states and Russia. Uh, and I want to start with this, what does uh, this model refer? Uh, this model referred the logic, despite of disagreements on mainly strategic issues, parties, the EU, the Brazil, uh, and Russia continue to have profitable economic relations. This was uh, usually referred or cited um, uh, by uh, 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 sitting uh, Schroeder's policy uh, towards Moscow. And of course, uh, according to my opinion, of course, an expectation and an assumption uh, was embedded to this model. Uh, the expectation uh, was very simple, actually. The Europeans, Westerners, through a trade, hope to create a kind of change in the behaviors of uh, Russia, in Russian assertiveness uh, in the neighborhood of Europe mainly. Uh, they also assume, assume that uh, Russian assertiveness in certain crisis points would be moderate because of the strategic conventional weakness of Russia. Uh, conventional strategic weakness of Russia pointing out both military weakness of Moscow and economic weakness of Russia. However, today, after of numbers of crises we uh, experience in the last decade, like Ukrainian crisis, like civil war in Ukraine, annexation of Crimea, what has um, Russian meddling to uh, electoral campaigns of European numbers of European states, a Russian meddling to internal affairs of the European states or accusations based on this, um, uh, this uh, assumptions, cyber attacks, assassinations, uh, attempt of assassinations, crisis in Belarus, accusation of spying, as we uh, witness um, during the uh, last couple of days uh, between. Uh, the crisis, Czechoslovakia, Czech uh, Republic and uh, Russia, uh, and harsh rhetoric used both sides towards each other. So we, we passed uh, numbers of crises one after another. This expectation and this assumption uh, related to Russian weakness and expectation related to changing uh, I mean, um, uh, prospect of uh, prospect for any change in Russian attitude has not been valid uh, actually anymore. However, and very interestingly, this does not mean either uh, business as usual model uh, change radically. Uh, still, it did not change mainly because of two reasons, I think. Uh, one is related to Russian side and the other is related to European side of story. Uh, the first, uh, the, if we uh, if uh, we need to start with the Russian side, uh, Russians do not want to lose European uh, 
uh, markets, they have not a diversified economy. They fight uh, numbers of little wars in numbers of fronts. Uh, so they need money actually. Uh, uh, Usually their economy is compared with the middle range economies like Spain or Portugal, etc. Uh, so the uh, and uh, Russia ha uh, has to fight in numbers of little wars, uh, but beyond that. Uh, she actually has engaged in a kind of psychological warfare uh, and uh, this psychological warfare and the actual little wars uh, needs uh, need uh, needed more capabilities uh, than what Spain or Portugal has uh, the long story short Moscow needs to have at the same time access to European markets while um, Kremlin has to continue to act in an opportunistic way to expand its, its influence in the European neighborhood. Uh, this act of opportunism is actually happening in two uh, different fronts. On the one hand, Russia uh, opportunistically expanded its strategic reach by exploiting Western indecisiveness and unwillingness to act she is in Syria now, uh, in Libya, in Karabakh. The situation in the transit state speaks out for themselves. Ukraine has been shattered. Uh, fragile situation has been continued in Donbas. Uh, separationists have been there and in Belarus. Uh, last operations actually prove that means has no actual maneuvering space to continue its balanced relations between Russia and the West. Uh, on the other hand, Russian opportunity, opportunism has been based on not total control or command capabilities, naval or air supremacy. Uh, but uh, we, I mean, it is uh, now uh, a kind of cliche, but Russian um, opportunism uh, is based on uh, its developing anti uh, area uh, A to A A D capabilities, uh, area uh, control, anti denial capabilities. Um, she has different A to A D bubbles uh, throughout European neighborhood. Uh, one bubble uh, is in Black Sea. Where the stronghold of this bubble is in Crimea uh, and due to the last crisis we know that we witnessed that Moscow is strengthened it with different capabilities including anti-submarine uh, capabilities electronic jamming capabilities um, air defense systems etc etc also we know the importance of black sea fleet uh, for this uh, a to ad bubble in the black sea but uh, of course black sea uh, a to ad bubble is not the only bubble that uh, russia uh, has acquired during the last decade. Uh, one is in South Caucasus and starting with 2008 war, Russia expanded this level actually. Uh, we can add uh, the uh, hazard flotage, uh, the strength of hazard flotide, uh, the, the maneuvering uh, capability of hazard flotide. We uh, can add uh, Russian newly acquired and uh, capabilities in the uh, or maneuvering space in the uh, Karabakh. There. We uh, should also add Russian upper hand on Armenia there. So Russia has uh, also a South Caucasus uh, bubble and uh, maybe uh, we all remember that South Caucasus is one of the 
area that European Union once uh, mentioned it or declared it uh, as part of as extension of its uh, neighborhood. Uh, one bubble is uh, in the Baltics, its stronghold is in Kaliningrad, one is in Eastern Mediterranean, uh, the, the basis of the base of this uh, bubble uh, can be accepted in Syria, but also Russian presence in Libya and elsewhere in Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, also, uh, uh, strengthen or support uh, Russian uh, uh, area def uh, area defense uh, area denial capabilities in Syria. Uh, when we look this picture, starting from Hazar uh, started from uh, South Caucasus to Black Sea to Baltics, then to Eastern Mediterranean. We can easily have a perception that Moscow is encycling Europe, uh, which is actually uh, not totally true. Yes, there. Uh, uh, we can we we can give certain rights to. Uh, this point, but it is actually a semi-true uh, uh, perception because of uh, many numbers of reasons. Uh, first of all, the strategic presence of Russia are in form of, and we should not forget it, are in form of A to AD capabilities. So they are very limited, though they are effective, they are very limited and they do not based on complete denial. Instead, denial of the rivals to access to, to these uh, bubbles or areas. Instead, they generate fear of casualties, fear of costly confrontation, uh, and uh, limited but very costly escalation. So actually, it's, uh, I mean, these bubbles, these capabilities, um, uh, on the one hand, are dependent on psychological fear uh, uh, behind of uh, capabilities. Psychological fear, fear of escalation, fear of confrontation, and fear of cost. Uh, according to some scholars, actually, to use these fears, uh, Russia used psychological and asymmetrical instruments range from hybrid war to electronic jamming to supporting extremist movements uh, to assassination etc etc and if we re uh, return back to our first assumption uh, uh, related to uh, uh, Russian uh, European uh, business uh, as usual. On the one hand, Russia tried to do business with Europeans because she need to do so. She needs money, she needs uh, have access to European market. But on the other hand, uh, Kremlin uses all these uh, terrorizing instruments to create an image that uh, or to uh, announce uh, a warning that do not dare to question uh, the effectiveness of my A to AD capabilities in your neighborhood. So this is not very easy job, even for Moscow. Moscow use it, Moscow has to use it because she has limited capabilities, actually, uh, but the, the um, I mean, um, uh, guaranteeing or the keeping the balance between these two ends is not very easy thing uh, uh, for the diplomatic or political. Uh, if we if we uh, take into consideration diplomatic and political side of the story, uh, and uh, this. Uh, point brings us to a uh, European side of story. Uh, numbers of scholar articles during the last decades uh, have been actually written, dedicated to the uh, answering the question, dedicating to answering the question of whether uh, 
uh, Europe can defend itself at the face of this challenge or not? Uh, some say simply no uh, by looking intention of uh, member states of European Union to invest collective capabilities of Europe. Uh, numbers of factors came to my mind affecting this ineffectiveness. Nationalism is, of course, uh, still uh, in a, a important factor if we think about uh, divergences between European uh, members um, uh, related to important uh, foreign and security policy issues. Uh, divergences among Europeans is not only uh, that are not only related to um, the issues uh, um, um, foreign and security policy issues. Uh, the, uh, the divergences are also related to their capabilities, their intentions to spend money on uh, their uh, defense uh, and from here i want to come to a uh, russian uh, energy equation because one of the important issue on which different kind of divergences emerge is related to this issue energy issues uh, are uh, uh, never uh, so uh, simple they always uh, complicated because uh, there is a uh, financial side of story, there is economic feasibility side of story, there is a um, uh, story related to diversification, etc. Et uh, and to uh, understand how this um, uh, energy issue uh, or energy relations with Russia is complicated for the European actors. Uh, looking to uh, Nord Stream 2 project or Balkan Stream is enough, I think. Uh, for example, Nord Stream 2, uh, take it, uh, please take it as an example. It was almost completed project, yes, millions of euros spent on this, yes. Uh, but uh, European parliaments on uh, political issues continue to protest it. Uh, US administration is against it. Uh, and that is why it is also related to Biden administration relations with the European partners, uh, whether it is Germany or other uh, patron states of the firms invested in this project. CATSA sanctions are on the table, um, uh, but we should not forget that this project is part of uh, diversification uh, issue uh, for the Europeans. And here uh, I come to another uh, tricky point. Uh, Ukraine is against it because it's actually bypassing Ukraine road and it's strengthened if it is realized. Uh, uh, completely, it strengthened Ukraine, uh, Ukraine isolation. So European members, we know Merkel and Macron come together and uh, they uh, actually uh, announced. Uh, we will come to discussing Ukraine uh, later on. So uh, I think in the second round we will have an okay. opportunity. So if we want to wrap up your uh, you know, initial comments, uh, I'm, I'm going to give sure. one more. And we're going to pass to uh, Ukraine debate. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Uh, maybe I should say three things uh, then. Uh, what uh, Europeans want to uh, want to uh, uh, to realize in terms of Russian uh, European relations. First, they want to change Russian behavior, but there is no political mechanism uh, to initiate this. Uh, Minsk process doesn't work. Uh, Normansk for, uh, for doesn't work. Uh, I mean, uh, they, uh, we don't have, uh, they uh, do have 
uh, uh, any kind of intention to create another one throughout uh, this escalation process. Um, secondly, they want to continue to have Russian gas as part of uh, diversification of energy. Uh, beyond, it is it is not just a want issue. It is necessary for some European member states, as we know, Baltic states, Eastern and some Eastern and Central European states are still dependent on Russian gas, uh, and they want to show weakness of Russia to Moscow by using different instruments. Yes, Russia is weak not so strong country, but showing Moscow weakness to Kremlin needed good arms, good allies, and good friends, if I want to recall Machiavelli's uh, words, and uh, whether uh, Europeans have uh, good arms, good uh, friends in the neighborhood, and now maybe we should come to uh, European uh, Turkish nor Turkey's relations normalization period um, uh, because it continues with ups and downs and it also creates a kind of limitation on European uh, relations with Russia uh, and good allies and this brings us to Biden's impact on EU-Russian relations uh, and the uh, cost of escalation that uh, in mind of Biden for the Europeans and for Ukrainians. Now I uh, want to stop uh, it. If we have chance to uh, develop our points in Queen and Station, I will be happy. Thank you. Thank you, Vishnu. I'm sure we'll have a second round, uh, but you uh, outlined a comprehensive picture. So most, uh, you know, this complexity is difficult to comprehend. Uh, I think, uh, as you mentioned, both parties are playing a game, but there is no overlap in the game. So, uh, and they don't actually speak to each other. So interestingly, uh, and they both think they are very effective. So if you ask from both sides, it looks uh, the same picture. So I, I would now uh, give the floor to uh, Amanda Paul. Uh, she has been a commentator about EU-Russian relations, Ukraine cri uh, crisis. Uh, so of course she has some uh, critical positions, critical views on this issue. So uh, uh, I will let Amanda uh, to comment on uh, EU strategy, weaknesses and stre uh, strength of this strategy, and how effective uh, can this strategy uh, in uh, with the, the addition of uh, Biden's perspective may uh, be a game changer in relations with Russia. I'll give a brief background about uh, Amanda. So Amanda Paul is a senior policy analyst in uh, the Europe with World Program at EPC. She has well established expertise on issues related to Turkish uh, foreign and domestic policy, Ukraine security and conflict resolution in Black Sea region, Russian foreign policy uh, and former Soviet space, Eastern neighborhood. So she had uh, also experience uh, International Center for Policy Studies in uh, Kiev. So she has been commenting on those uh, issues uh, we follow. So, uh, Amanda, what do you think about uh, if you uh, from the Brussels, you know, what is uh, seen effective? What are the outlines of the strategy? And is this strategy really uh, working uh, in, uh, you know, managing the uh, balance with Russia? Um, thank you very much, Paula, and thank you to Seta for inviting me to speak um, today. Um, I'm basically going to give a short um, overview of how I see the EU's relations with Russia, uh, and then I will say a few words about the current um, crisis um, at the Ukrainian-Russia border. Um, I think any of you who've listened to President Putin's annual speech um, that he did earlier today um, can understand that, that he is on increasing tensions between the EU and the US, and these tensions 
uh, are already under strain. I mean, he's talked about how the EU and the US shouldn't um, be provoking Russia, shouldn't get into the hairs of Russia, otherwise there are going to be consequences. So he he is trying to set the picture that there's a new crisis that's being um, wrought um, between over the sort of Ukraine Russia border, but this is that's being you know pushed by. Um, the side of the EU and the US, which we all know is a pack of, um, but this is what the Russians do. They're good at selling these sort of propagandas. But I think it, this this um, this situation demonstrates that uh, the relationship is very strained. Um, it's antagonistic. This is business as usual, um, and it's nothing new. Now, if we go back to January 2014, you know, time ago. Um, in Brussels, EU leaders cancelled a dinner at that time um, with President Putin. He was there for the EU summit. Um, the EU leaders were trying to, oh, there's no business as usual with you, Mr. Putin, um, because of the pudding on Ukraine um, to reject closer ties um, with the EU. Of course, that was around the time um, when Ukraine's former president, Yanukovych, had um, pulled out of signing an association agreement um, with the EU, and it was the beginning of the Maidan um, protest. Russia was very much um, opposed uh, to Ukraine having closer to the EU and pressurized um, Ukraine. They wanted Ukraine to become closer uh, to Moscow. And this was the sort of response from the EU. This was their policy. We won't invite President to dinner. Um, did Putin care? No, of course he didn't. Um, he went went on to send green men to Crimea, uh, to sub subsequently annex and occupy Crimea, and then to instigate the war in the Donbass, um, which is still going on today, and then trying to blame it onto Ukraine by using, you know, what the Russians love to use. It's called plausible um, deniability. Um, so I would say that there's no business as usual, but no business as usual has become business as usual um, with the Russians. But even when we go back to before 2014, you know, relations then were, you know, very tricky. I mean, the 2008 Russia-Georgia war um, with tanks, with Russian tanks coming quickly to a stone's throw um, of Tbilisi. Um, but back then, I mean, the, the EU, the US um, seemed to, you know, have decided this would be, you know, a one-off mistake by the Russians, you know, um, they wouldn't do it again. Um, so they decided at that point um, to give Russia... Um, another chance, I guess we all remember the famous reset button, which was, you know, inscribed with, you know, the wrong Russian word in the first place, being delivered, I think, by the Secretary of State uh, to the Russians. Um, unfortunately, that re reset never happened. Now, developments in Ukraine um, have taken, basically took relations to rock bottom. And if we look at what's happened in Queen, um, for example, as was already mentioned actually by Vishne, um, carrying out disinformation campaigns, cyber attacks, assassination attempts, some of them successful, some of them not, being carried out domestically and abroad, election interference, a crackdown on political opposition, uh, and of course the, the most recent disastrous visit um, of EU um, foreign chief um, Joseph Borrell to, to Moscow, which ended with um, him being humiliated by uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, on top of that, we now have the ongoing situation uh, with uh, Alexander Navalny, whose life is more or less hanging by a thread, uh, and Russia's military deployment on the Ukrainian border, uh, which risks much further escalation. I mean, I think we can say that, you know, EU-Russia relations are at their lowest point since the breakup of the Soviet Union. Um, and I don't see any chance of changing soon. We've seen that Russia has absolutely no problem flouting international and causing disruption to achieve strategic objectives. Strategic objectives, no matter what the cost, um, are a priority for Putin and his revisionists, whether that be in the EU's eastern neighbourhood, in the Middle East. Um, this is not going to change. Uh, the Russians' uh, leadership at the moment will continue um, to undermine EU stability and security when they consider that their strategic objectives um, are at risk. And this, of course, includes Russia viewing the democratic transformations um, in the EU's eastern neighbourhood, let's say eastern countries, you know, as a threat. 
um, Russia doesn't accept the sovereign choices neighbors because the problem is um, one day the Russian selves may look to Ukraine, Moldova or Georgia um, or some of the other countries and say, wow, look, these countries have democratized. They have a proper rule of law. They have proper you know, respect for human rights. You know, we need to get that into Russia. Um, this is not what the Kremlin desires. So, you know, a priority of Russia to undermine these changes in the EU, say this is the fault of the EU, we have these tensions because you're forcing these countries um, to the to you. And this is just not true. You know, the EU is not forcing any of these countries um, to be part of Eastern Partnership or to choose a European path. This is a, a you know, a free of these countries uh, themselves. But still, while we see that the relationship between Russia and the EU is difficult, um, they do cooperate. They cooperate really all of areas, you know, space, science, technology, education, environment, sport, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, the problem is that the EU has failed to, ca to carve out a real strategy or a credible, proactive policy um, for dealing with Russia. Now, since um, Mrs. Uh, Mogherini, the previous um, foreign chief, when she was, when it was her time in office, you know, the EU came up with these five guiding principles for relations um, with Russia, which were basically um, full implementation of the Minsk Agreement, um, closer ties with um, former Soviet neighbors, strengthening resilience to Russian threats and selective en engagement um, on certain issues, um, and also people-to-people -people contacts. Now, unfortunately, it proved impossible um, to implement this um, set of the balls, particularly the full implementation of the Minsk Agreement, um, which is basically further away now than it probably was um, in the aftermath of the of, of the war in the Donbass. And more recently, um, Mr. Borrell has come up with this push back, contain and engage slogan. Frankly, I still really don't know what that means. Um, probably most people don't know. Um, and so far, I have to say, I don't see they was doing much pushing back, you know, particularly um, the most recent example would be, you know, the development um, around the border with Ukraine. So now we need to ask the question, you know, why can't the EU come up with a really good policy, a united policy, a constructive, proactive policy towards Russia? Now, the first is, which was already mentioned, that they don't have a common approach with the exception of sanctions, which is unique, actually. Um, there's probably a unique example of when the EU uh, member states are able to you know, pursue one uh, one objective. And this came about because of the horrendous um, activities that Russia carried out um, in Ukraine, particularly the down of this jet over the Donbass. I mean, this was really um, a breaking point, I think, where the EU member states really realised they had to come together and come up with a robust um, respond. And even though some member states today would like to see some of those sanctions lifted, um, they've managed to hold together. And this is important because it shows that the EU has unity. Um, of course, we do, how, how long that's going to last in the long run, you know, that remains to be seen. Um, but it's important that it's there um, today. Um, the way that member states view Russia also is very different. Some view Russia um, as an important partner, others view it as a security threat, you know, others view it um, as important to their security. I mean, there's a, there's a long list, um, and this makes it very difficult sometimes um, to get agreement on things. As was mentioned before, you know, the Nord Stream uh, pipeline um, is the most obvious um, example with some member states, you know, vehemently opposed, um, but Germany still sticking to its guns and going forward, even at the risk of you know, US sanctions. I mean, the Americans have a very tough approach on this pipeline, much tougher um, than what the Europeans is. But I mean, the point is, is the divergence exists between member states um, continue to be capitalized on by the Russians, say not, not as much um, as they were in the past. So there are divergences that the Rus Russians do cap capitalize on. Um, and also another important point is that Putin or the Kremlin just absolutely does not want to change his foreign policy or his domestic policy. 
So in fact, I don't think there's anything that the EU or anybody else could actually do at this point. Um, perhaps not even the Chinese, maybe. They're, they're, they're the ones that the, the Russians have respect for. But I mean, he doesn't want to change. Um, Putin, you know, and not only Putin, you know, many other of his cronies um, consider Russia to be a really great, um, and the Kremlin wants to shape the world. It doesn't want to be shaped by the EU or any other actor. It doesn't want to be dictated to. Um, and, and certainly um, Russia's leadership today doesn't want to become like Europe. It doesn't want to model itself on a European member state. That's probably, you know, very far from his from his ideal. Um, so, so the Russians, the, Putin has no interest in at all, really, in what EU leaders, and when I talk about EU leaders, I'm talking about, you know, Charles, um, Borrell or von der Leyen really have to say. Um, his he remains um, with national capitals, and this is where policy is shaped. Also, I mean, this was a trend that Russia started, you know, let's focus on national capital, it's about EU uh, bureaucracy, but it seems to have been copied by, you know, a number of other countries now. So I would say that Russia has really no intention of changing course um, for the time being, probably not for any time that, that Putin um, is in power, and that could still be quite a long time. They're not interested um, in building a more constructive relationship with you. And I think that European Union um, should have no illusions about Putin you know, disappearing or crumbling anytime soon. I, I know that these massive um, protests in Russia um, because of uh, Navalny and the protests going on, and I believe there's going to be a new huge protest, but I've protests um, for many different reasons that, you know, I don't have the time to go into, um, aren't going to bring down um, the Putin um, regime, the Kremlin, um, anytime soon. Um, so don't expect there to be any, you know, suitcases being packed in the near future. I mean, despite the fact that, you know, Russia faces huge socioeconomic challenges, um, they're very resourceful. They still have a huge... Um, fund of money of billions and billions um, from their oil riches which, um, they have kept hold of for many years. This money can be dispersed whenever it's necessary um, to of the population to, you know, to sort of tamper down um, feelings of unhappiness. Um, so they do have resources uh, and they're resilient and could remain in power for some, some for several years uh, to come. So it's really up to the EU to develop a more robust um, approach. Now, I just want to say, you know, a few words about um, about the situation on Ukraine. I mean, I think it's an extremely worrying situation that we now have. I mean, reportedly, at least one tenth of the entire Russian military are reported to be um, at the the border uh, with or in um, in occupied um, Crimea or around there. You know, adding, you know, field hospitals you know, artillery and supply. I mean, the Russians still claim it's for a big military exercise, but I mean, I don't think you need some of these um, things for a military exercise. Um, the Kremlin still continues to, you know, say that Ukraine um, is preparing um, for war, that it's looking for a, a military into the Donbass conflict, and that NATO and the United States are conspiring with Ukraine to retake uh, Crimea. I mean, this is absolute rubbish. This is lies. Uh, and this is, again, you know, nonsense being spewed out of all of the Kremlin's different um, propaganda machines and tools and robots. Um, and I would say that this anti-Ukrainian propaganda um, hasn't been so high since 2014. I mean, this is very worrying. I mean, personally, I don't think that Russia is going to launch a full-scale military operation. Um, that isn't normally what um, Russia does. Um, Russia tries to, you know, show a situation on the ground um, that it can sort of justify to itself that it needed to intervene. Uh, and it does this by trying to provoke um, Ukrainians in one way or another uh, to justify a military response um, from the Kremlin, which it blames on Kiev and the West. I mean, this is what it did in the first place. 
um, in Donbass the last time, it'll say, oh yes, um, the rights of um, Russian minorities are under under threat. You know, we need to in and save them. Um, so we've seen this. We've seen how Russia has done this before, um, and we've we've seen it do it quite, um, um, let's say, quite successfully. If I if I can put it that way. I mean, the one time where it didn't use that tactic was when it um, annexed uh, annexed Crimea. I mean, it just went in and did it. Um, and then justified it by saying we we needed to do it because of this this that or this that or or the other, but I mean I, this is why I don't believe that Russia will launch a full scale military operation. But then you could ask yourself, you know, why why do why is Russia doing this now? I don't think anybody has um, a real answer to that question. I mean, is it to test the Biden administration? It could be. Um, could it be to reinforce its position in the Donbass? I mean, the the uh, the actual process of conflict resolution has sort of hit hit a, a, bri a brick wall. Um, so the Russians could perhaps want to be, um, let's say, digging down and doubling down on their presence in, re in, the, in, that, in that region. Um, is it to secure water resources um, or Crimea? Um, is it just to show that Russia um, won't, won't um, listen to US pressure or doesn't fear American pressure? Um, or maybe Russia, you know, just wants to demonstrate that it should still be the number one adversary of the West um, and not China, um, which has moved up to take that place. I mean, it can be any one of those things. Um, Putin uses unpredictability as one of the tools to keep the West off balance um, and use Russia's uh, time. This, this, this again, this, this, the slogan "plausible deniability" is something that it uses um, all the time. But I mean, now if we look at what the EU is actually doing about this, I mean, I can't say it's doing very much. I mean, so far the EU called for de for de de escalation, um, but apart from that, uh, and of course, um, continuing to support Ukraine's territorial integrity, um, there hasn't been very much else said. I think that again, there's probably some. Um, differences between, you know, EU member states. At this point, some member states would like sanctions already to be put on Russia, but others have this wait and see approach. You know, the wait and see approach is never really the good one. I, I personally think that Europe needs to make it clear to Moscow, um, first of all, that it won't accept Russian propaganda about states' intentions um, as reasons of, of war. This is nonsense. And European leaders should also be publicly um, calling out Russia for the lies uh, that it's that it's um, telling um, about Ukraine and the plans of Ukrainian leadership. Ukraine needs all of the all of the support it can get from all of its allies at the moment. Uh, I also believe there's a, a good reason that they should already be preparing, you know, a plan of action uh, just in case some sort of military a situation does occur. It should, of course, be done in cooperation with the United States, but also with the UK, with Canada, and other important parts um, in the event of military aggression. And this could include, you know, new, uh, you know, already, you know, a paper that could bring together new tough sanctions on Russia, um, agreed to support Ukraine with, you know, lethal lethal weapons if it has to go back to. Uh, to another a huge another military confrontation with the Russians, and um, hopefully it won't come to this. But I mean, indifference, um, the side of the EU and divisions really only um, emboldens um, the Kremlin and should be uh, avoided at any costs. Um, so I think I spoke for too long, so I will stop there. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Amanda. You give a, a very broad picture about some of the critical issues with regard to EU's strategy or lack of uh, strategy. Uh, sure, uh, I mean, we have more questions than, you know, <laughs> uh, the beginning of the, uh, the panel. So I will start with uh, uh, Amanda because it is connected to the res this recent uh, uh, crisis in Ukraine. So, I mean, we've been, I've been following the, uh, you know, talks, you know, diplomatic, um, you know, maneuvers of the leaders in Europe and in Russia. So as we see, they don't speak to each other. I mean, they say whatever they want to say on their own terms and on their own, uh, you know, understanding. And they don't seem to be responding to uh, each other. 
So this is a bit worrying because uh, it seems that there is two different uh, games here. So Russia feels militarily quite comfortable and with that comfort wants to push forward its uh, her own agenda. Whereas Europeans, I think, uh, exaggerate the role of uh, economy in this issue. And uh, Putin doesn't seem to be concerned about his own image. So, I mean, uh, under this circumstance, uh, how effective do you think uh, can Europe and also transatlantic uh, alliance be effective without putting more military presence, without uh, military, uh, you know, uh, personnel and uh, resources? But so, to what extent they can be successful without pushing? And if they put more military, then it fits to better to Russia's game plan. So what do you think about this? So without uh, military, Russia does not necessarily talk to Europeans in their own game. But if they put more military presence, then it would also fit to Russia's game plan. So how do you see the situation? I mean, is, is this a trap? I mean, I don't... I I mean, I don't think it's on the cards anyway for, because um, we're talking about NATO here, um, mm. for NATO to significantly enhance um, its presence on Russia's uh, on Russia's border. I mean, NATO already has a significant presence um, on that border. Uh, you know, both up in the you know the Baltics on the on the Black Sea, um, in Germany, there's you know there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of troops. Um, so I don't think. Um, this is going to change. I mean, maybe you have a rotation or a few more here and there, or they move from one, you know, from one de one deployment area to another. Um, but the numbers um, will remain the same, um, and it's good that they remain the same um, because I think the bigger threat actually comes from the Russian side than it does from the side of, let's say, the transatlantic, the transatlantic alliance. But I mean, we know for many, many years that you know the Russians sell um, the the West as a bogeyman, you know, up to no good. Um, who's going to invade Russia or something one of these days? Um, you know, this is this is simply not true. I mean, I support dialogue, ongoing dialogue between Russia um, and the EU, uh, and that you know there is dialogue, um, not as much as there was in the past. But I mean, on the areas that you know I mentioned before, um, there is dialogue. But I mean, you, there's no point in just you know sitting um, for the, the the sake of sitting and not having any sort of um, positive or even partially positive outcome. I mean, there's been many efforts from the, the EU side to try and change the dynamic. I mean, the last effort, and as far as I know, it's still going on, was the one by President Macron. Um, and he had um, several encounters with President Putin. He wanted to reset relations between the, between the EU um, and Russia. And actually, some in the EU thought that President Macron's um, policy was going too far given the fact that at the end of the day the russians are still you know occupying crimea the the the, the conflict in donbass um is still gone the russians haven't met their their um the the criteria that they need um within the framework of the Min the minsk agreement um you know also the eu and the and russia um have contact on some other areas of mutual interest um for the iran nuclear deal the jcpoa um, they are in dialogue vis-a-vis -vis that, but an interest on climate change um, and on on other issues. Issues, you know, the same with the United States. But I mean, now I mean, but now the vision of the EU. I mean, it's 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 like poles apart. Um, they're going to reach an agreement at this time on issues where the Russians believe there needs to be. You know, a I mean, we're talking about um, European security. I mean, the Russians would like to have a new model for European security. You know, that doesn't that isn't that doesn't have any real buy in. Um, and also when it comes to, you know, the countries, what we could call call in, in between. I mean, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be, you know, Russia um, and the EU that are, you know, choosing the destiny of these countries.
I mean, the EU isn't choosing the destiny of these countries. These countries should be allowed to choose the destiny, their own destiny themselves. Um, the problem is that Russia, as I mentioned, doesn't want them um, to choose their own destiny. I mean, and the, the, the funny point is, I mean, none of these countries have got any chance of getting into NATO or the EU anytime soon. Um, maybe never. Um, this is something that the, the, the EU doesn't have a policy um, of enlargement to any of the Eastern Partnership countries on the table, and it may never have uh, a, a, a policy on the table. But I mean, I think um, unless there's some sort of shift in approach um, from from the Russian side, it's going to be very difficult to have any sort of constructive dialogue um, in the in the in the near, near future. Um, and that's a tragedy because ultimately Russia is a is Europe and it's an it's an important um, part of Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. So, Mishnojan, you mentioned about some fears, and if you uh, look from the Russian side, they feel a bit betrayed about uh, you know Western expansion. So there is a sense of betrayal. But you also listen to uh, Ukrainian side. They also feel betrayed because they give up their nuclear program, they give up some of their some of their strategic arms program, and in return they didn't get NATO membership and EU membership. So there is both sense of betrayal uh, and also betrayal from EU and also uh, the NATO. So uh, I mean, how far this do you think these grievances, uh, you know, can affect their uh, policy lines and um, do you do you see more aggressive uh, response uh, of arm, you know armament from the Ukrainian side and also uh, to what extent these grievances uh, change Russia's strategic posture long-term strategic plans I mean can this be really satisfied I mean of course uh, Yes, there are some grievances, but if you look at the Russian diplomacy, it's quite realistic. So, I mean, I mean, to what extent emphasizing some of the grievances, taking into account the Russian grievances, can help to reduce the tension? Do you think there's potential there? And also, uh, what may be, um, you know, some tools to address uh, grievances of the Ukrainian side? They really feel also betrayed. Sis. Sis, I'm yours. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Sorry for this. Okay. Uh, uh, some of your questions uh, are very interesting, actually, especially whether uh, is there any point for the satisfaction of Russia. Uh, yes, you are right. Russia felt that after the uh, Cold War, felt that it's, uh, uh, it was encycled by Western institutions, instruments, ideas, etc., etc. And the uh, I mean, uh, and she felt this encyclement because she also uh, uh, very uh, she was very much aware that uh, she had certain. Uh, strategic weakness, uh, conventional weakness, technological weakness, and she uh, used, exploited uh, Western divergences, um, uh, ignorance, strategic negligence, whatever you uh, say, in Ukraine, in Syria, in Libya, etc., uh, to uh, engage to uh, engage this A to A D uh, no uh, notion to its strategic doctrine, uh, but uh, though Russia seems to be very successful in engaging A to A D uh, warfare, uh, we should not forget that Russia is very tired state actually she is overstretched now uh, yes you mentioned economy uh, in terms of i mean when we compare the economic loss to the strategic loss yes uh, 
a strategic role as a reference point is always more important than economic loss or economic um, uh, negative prospect. But economy still matters. It, it, uh, it was the basis of the uh, power generation. So you cannot actually ignore this side of story. Russia is overstretched. Russia is tired. Uh, and for example, uh, Amanda uh, very rightly mentioned that Russia uh, had, has to undermine the change in its uh, internal affairs in her neighborhood. And this uh, undermining uh, process also needs efforts, uh, needs time, money, and um, actually uh, she uh, turned to be very busy uh, where some other developments happen. Uh, sanctions, yes, uh, did not change Russian behavior, but damage actually Russian economy. Uh, the uh, the uh, maybe the major point is that uh, sticks I mean, Westerners or uh, uh, Westerns, uh, Western and uh, Western actors and USA actually have enough sticks to uh, test or to push Russia back. But these sticks carry a very high risk of confrontation and casualties. And neither, uh, I don't believe that neither Biden administration nor Europeans, Europeans have also capability problems for this. Uh, Biden administration, I don't expect anything from the, uh, for, different from deterrence. Okay? So sticks uh, available, available in the hands of Westerners, but uh, uh, now, uh, apart from testing uh, limits of Russia, uh, they seem to be useless. Um, so testing, uh, this, this crisis can be interpreted as also uh, testing efforts for both sides because Biden administration announced what uh, US uh, is coming back. So uh, uh, USA wanted uh, to show its presence with uh, sticks, yes, but uh, I mean, uh, co uh, full heartly commitment to uh, this kind of uh, backing story uh, needed more than a show or more than a theater, uh, let's say. Uh, so, what we have? No constructive dialogue, yes. Maybe we don't need constructive dialogue. No de-escalation mechanism. Yes, de-escalation mechanism could be very helpful in this crisis, but we don't have. But the escalation should be taken under control because it is very, very risky for not only Ukrainians, but also Europeans. Turning Ukraine as a place of, if we're talking about not Crimea, but Donbass, uh, turning Ukraine to a place or uh, to an environment of proxy wars um, will very, very, uh, will create very, very negative impact for the Ukrainian security, yes, but also it creates a very negative impact for the European security. And usually we mention that or we assume that Russians uh, uh, want, Russia wants such kind of development. I mean, turning Donbass or turning whole Ukraine, a kind of proxy war. But proxy war, uh, as we know from Syria, Libya, they are very uh, tiresome. And Russia is actually a kind of reaching its limits. And such kind of proxy war can also uh, a challenge actually Russian capabilities and I think Russia uh, do not want such kind of development she just want to show its own stick and its own uh, uh, not the limits but its own commitment to her um, A to AD strategy and its psychological um, 
maybe you talk about grievances, but uh, I think fear uh, can be more explainable, explaining the situation uh, than grievances because Russia wanted to uh, wanted uh, not to uh, lose this um, uh, fear factor uh, using, I mean, one uh, after another mm -hmm. her uh, assertiveness in different fronts and if and westerners and uh, americans actually uh, uh, keep their uh, silence uh, on this assertiveness and russia wanted to create this kind of image next step again will be result uh, resulting in another silence in the western uh, side so if she lost this kind of fear factor, uh, this kind of uh, advantage, then, I mean, uh, one of the uh, pillars uh, on which this A to AD uh, capabilities depends, uh, depend on uh, can be lost also for Russia. So I think this, uh, the two sides, two, two types of deterrence game actually, uh, played by different sides, by Westerners and Russians, but the escalation actually can happen very easily because, as you say, uh, they uh, there is no talk uh, uh, among each other, and they can uh, uh, interpret their uh, movements uh, from different uh, uh, by using different. I, I want to turn to Amanda about this issue. I mean. Amanda, do you agree that uh, really Russian side is overstretched and the Europeans are calculating that, you know, Russia involving in lots of uh, unnecessary uh, tensions uh, will eventually give up? Is there a strategy behind this policy or is it just, a, you know, inertia? <laughs> well, in my dealing with the Russians, you know, they never give up. When they have a strategic objective in their mind, they tend to see it through to the end. Um, I would say that, yes, Russia on, does look like it's stretching itself. I mean, we thought Russia was stretching itself before they went to Syria, but they still went to Syria. Um, then we heard immediately, I think, from Barack Obama, um, it will be a disaster. The Russians will be leaving here very quickly. Um, the Russians have been in there, you know, several years. Um, and they've managed to, let's say, expand their influence in the whole Middle East um, quite effectively in different ways. Yes, the Russians don't have a lot of money. They can't invest. Um, but, I mean, they can sell. You know, they sell their arms. You know, they sell their energy. So they do deals. They do it in the Middle East and they do it in Africa. They've expanded their presence presence there. You know, arms for mines or arms for minerals. You know, arms for energy. You know they're qu they're quite cre they're quite creative, um, so I don't see that that we're going to see a significant, you know, drawback if I can use that word, um, of Russia anywhere. I mean, if anything, Russia is you know boosting its present. I mean, they've just you know deployed this peacekeeping mission um, into Nagorno Karabakh in addition to the peacekeeping, if you can call them peacekeeping, in the operations that they have, you know, throughout that region. You know, they've transformed Crimea into one huge Russian um, military base. That's what Crimea is this day, a military base that's a peninsula that's devoid um, of any sort of human rights. It's become a human rights black hole. You know, as um, as Vishne has pointed out, you know they've they've taken they have these strategic bubbles all across the you know the Black Sea, to the Caspian. Um, they they have a, a network of different um, of uh, military bases and st and strategic areas. Um, they've expanded themselves in a way possibly that people in the West didn't 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 imagine. Um, but I mean, when it just to come back to um, to Ukraine um, for a moment. I mean, the Russians have a have a strategic objective in Ukraine. It's the same objective they've had um, at the beginning, and that is to always have a say in Ukraine's foreign and security policy, um, to have a voice that will prevent Ukraine developing or becoming integrated to the Euro Atlantic institutions. This was the main. This was the objective right from the beginning. This was why the Russians made 
President Yanukovych ditch the association agreement um, and this approach continues to today you know ditto um, for Georgia and personally although many people might not agree with me you know I think that the approach particularly from NATO actually of promising Ukraine and Georgia a seat at the table um, but then not actually delivering this membership action plan is the wrong approach I think that we should get rid of this sort of um, grey zone and actually, you know, make this commitment, say you have a membership action plan, you know, as from today, you know, we need to be strong um, because it looks at the moment as if we're giving the Russians a veto um, on membership of this organization. Um, and this is really the wrong, this is really the wrong approach to have. Um, and the reason why the conflict in the Donbass hasn't been resolved, because we've been talking and talking and talking for years now, um, since 2014, you know, to find a to find a solution to any conflict. And by the way, this conflict should never have happened in the first place. You know, I visited Donbass a lot of times. Um, there was never any trouble there. It was just something that was cooked up. But I mean, it takes a constructive, compromising approach. Um, and Ukraine, of course, I'm not going to say that Ukraine's always the, the perfect and most constructive um, partner, but I mean, Ukraine is the victim. Ukraine is the victim in this picture. Um, it's the Russians that, you know, violated their territorial integrity, you know, put their proxies there and carry out this war until today, you know, violating the ceasefire um, and whatnot. I mean, let's not remember that Russia, let's not forget, sorry, you know, that the Russia of today is a country that doesn't think twice about violating international law, um, about um, changing the borders of Europe um, or about poisoning um, individuals and in some case leading to their death um, just because it doesn't like them. You know, this is the sort of country and leadership that we're dealing with. And I don't think this is going to change. And this makes it extremely difficult um, to deal with, with um, President Putin and the rest of the guys in the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. So, Vishnu, I'm going to switch to you. Uh, I mean, in your report, you mentioned about energy relations, these, uh, you know, pipelines. So mm -hmm. if we go back to 2014 and compare to today, I think the dependency on Russian energy is in decline. And if mm -hmm. we consider a uh, European country's investment of renewable energy, uh, I think in the future, this will decline even further. So what do you think this uh, you know, reduction in energy dependency, how it is gonna uh, affect mm -hmm. the balance and can it play negative as well? Because we know that this uh, dependency may also help reduce tensions. Of course, uh, it may uh, reduce uh, use mm -hmm. dependency in the positive side, but on the negative side, uh, sometimes these trade relations may also limit tensions. Mm -hmm. So what is your take on, on this? So already in comparison to 2014, yeah. there's decline. And how how are we going to uh, analyze the situation? Yes, you are right. Market conditions has uh, have been changing. Um, the uh, LNG uh, is in uh, is uh, on European markets. Even American LNG, mm -hmm. Shell based LNG, uh, is on market. Mm -hmm. Uh, Azerbaijan gas, Hazar uh, gas uh, is in market. I mean, uh, these renewables uh, since um, 2006, 2008, green uh, paper, uh, 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 Europeans try to uh, increase the uh, share of renewables in their energy uh, equations and they succeeded they they uh, uh, succeeded uh, a lot in this regard so yes the market conditions have been changing but not uh, this actually did not change fun issue uh, uh, some European members European Union members dependence on Russian gas still Baltics, still some uh, Eastern and uh, uh, Central European states. Uh, so, uh, even if we take the Western Balkans, they, they are not part of European Union, but they uh, are uh, actually locating on, in the neighborhood of uh, Union. So uh, we can add uh, them to the story also. Uh, their dependence on Russia, 
uh, is continuing. Uh, so yes, the market is promising uh, from uh, one perspective, uh, but from another perspective, it does create um, any tangible change in terms of uh russian uh european union uh energy relations uh even in 2014 western european countries had uh, 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 a kind of asymmetrical uh dependency with, uh, in, in terms of their relations with russia uh, take for example german case i mean germany is france um, all the Western European countries, actually, their dependency on Russian gas uh, was not on equal base uh, with the Eastern and uh, Eastern Central European and Baltic states, even at that moment. Uh, today, this divergence in the European Union between uh, those states dependent on Russia and those states uh, having uh more luxury more divergences in their um energy portfolio and still continuing and um i want to add uh, one more thing yes today we have green deal we have renewables we have diversified uh routes uh in europe uh, and some of these routes actually uh uh put on the table by Ra by russia itself north stream Balkan stream, etc. Uh, but uh, energy independence or more uh, or less dependence on Russian um, energy resources uh, needed more than these things, more than this prospect, needed more integrated, uh, more coherent energy policies for the union members. Uh, and when we talk about more integrated infrastructure, for example, energy infrastructure, this needs money, money, investment and intention and also commitment. So, for example, take uh, Bulgaria. Uh, usually uh, scholars uh, accuse Bulgaria for the for her close ties with Russia. But I mean, Bulgaria has to uh, buy gas from Russia because uh, she has no other alternative. Even Europeans uh, know this situation and the other alternatives may create further uh, I mean, uh, uh, disadvantages or negative effect for the union, uh, whether it's environmental effect or economic effect. They actually close their eyes to certain uh, relations between Bulgaria and yeah. Russia. Uh, in order to, I mean, complete all this picture in terms of European Union policies, uh, Europe uh, needs time, uh, management, good management, uh, uh, less divergences and money and the money uh, is really important because yes uh, some european members have money to invest their own national projects but in terms of union uh, we can see the gap within the uh, among the members and this created further cracks uh, that can be easily exploited by russia or by others uh, external players, Trump administration also exploited them to both uh, access to to both to have access uh, into market, uh, defense market, energy market, etc. So it is not only related to Russia, but re uh, Russian story is continuing today despite of the changes in the market. This is important thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, Amanda, uh, I will give all of you, uh, both of you, uh, the last word, so we have to wrap up. So, what are your suggestions uh, about the escalation of the situation without capitulation from the European side? So, without, you know, uh, uh, you know reducing um, their image, how, how can they de-escalate the situation. Is it possible or do you expect 
uh, further escalation in the coming months. I mean, if you're talking about EU-Russia relations um, generally, um, mm -hmm. I honestly don't think there's very much the EU can do to improve this relationship for the time being. I think they're just going to have to um, be more or less, you know, I wouldn't say silent, but I mean quite quite low-key, low, low because I mean trying to have any sort of constructive dialogue with the Russians at the moment um, it's just so difficult because each side is looking at things very differently. I mean, obviously, if the worst case would happen around Ukraine um, and there is um, an escalation that leads to a military confrontation, you know, the European Union must um, boost its support for Ukraine and it must take further measures towards Russia. And this should include much tougher sanctions, you know, sanctions that... Um, target um, those people close to um, Putin and some of the other um, high-level people in the Kremlin, um, but also, you know, do more things in, Euro in the European Union itself. You know, let's let's try and crack down on some of these corrupt, um, illicit money flows um, in some in some member states. I mean, I can no longer talk about London Grad because the UK is no longer in the in the, in um. In, a, in the EU, but I mean, in some other countries, you still have a lot of oligarch money floating around. Um, and also, you know, more measures could be taken to beef up um, Black Sea security um, from the side, or, the side of NATO. I mean, we've seen already in the last few days, I mean, the UK um, and others have, you know, increased their presence in the Black Sea. But I think in the, in the dialogue more generally, I think they're going to just have to give time um, and space um, for things to improve, but I, because I just don't see that happening um, for the time being. Thank you. I mean, my last question to both of you. Uh, Turkey have a difficult balance. So, of course, deep uh, relations, economic relations, and, uh, you know, certain cooperation areas with Russia and also strategic cooperation with Ukraine. So what, what are your, you know, uh, what do you think, you know, Turkey should play you know uh, what what role do you think uh, turkey should play in this game or we'll start <laughs> me uh, uh, yes and I'll, i'm also okay asking. let's start with vishnu jam and uh, i will go okay. to <laughs> okay thank you uh, I mean, Turkey, I think it's uh, a good job in this regard uh, because Turkey's position is very uh, delicate. I mean, she tried to control a delicate balance, uh, not only between Ukraine and Russia. She has good relations with both of uh, them, but also she is a member of NATO. So uh, Black Sea uh, balance of power is uh, important for her and um, for her transatlantic ties, of course. Uh, but as Amanda mentioned that, I mean, uh, NATO deterrence uh, function, uh, functions very well, actually, in Europe, uh, in, in terms, uh, I mean, NATO strengthened its presence in uh, European, European continent uh, uh, to, uh, apart from Turkey, to other states uh, are NATO members in Black Sea. So, I mean, NATO have actually access to Black Sea region. So, I mean, uh, NATO deterrence on the right track. Uh, but this does not change uh, the fact that the situation is delicate and fragile, uh, and it is why Turkey underline uh, underline two points. I think very important. One is territorial integrity of Ukraine, because as it is mentioned he uh, here uh, in this panel, uh, annexation of Crimea uh, and the I mean, civil war in uh, Ukraine. Let's say civil war. Uh, is against, I mean, especially annexation of uh, 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 Crimea and the aggression, Russian aggression towards uh, Ukraine, uh, is against international law. So, uh, uh, I mean, pointing out this, I mean, uh, Ukraine, uh, weak, uh, Ukraine uh, position as victim of aggression is important. 
and uh, this does not uh, this should not be um, uh, uh, mixed with uh, other uh, uh, policies. I mean, uh, pushing Ukraine too much, provocating Ukraine too much uh, towards uh, Russia. Uh, and apart from this, Ankara uh, actually uh, uh, warned the parties that uh, she does not want to see another Libya, another Syria in Ukraine. Uh, that is why she uh, actually uh, suggested um, uh, de-escalation and control of escalation. Uh, dialogue, and especially uh, she underlined um, the need of regional uh, de-escalation mechanisms for the regional solutions. Um, indeed, this point is very important because, yes, Ukraine is victim and Russia is assertive, etc., etc. But the the game, uh, if the game keeps on as deterrence game, then there is a risk for Ukraine for the further territorial loss uh, of Ukraine, and that is why escalation should be under control. Uh, and uh, uh, we know the uh, situation in international law. So the dialogue uh, and uh, uh, the escalation mechanism should be based on this. Uh, uh, I think Turkey's position in this regard uh, both strengthen its own uh, balanced uh, foreign policy objectives towards uh, two states, but also she uh, has balanced approach uh, in terms of her NATO uh, membership and uh, uh, continuing balance, power balance in the Black Sea. Thank you. Amanda, my also thank you, uh, Vishnu Hocam. Amanda, my last question to you. Um, what, what does Brussels expect from Turkey? What kind of role do they expect uh, Turkey to play? Uh, in this game, is there a specific, you know, expectation of what? What do you see the situation? I mean, I don't think that the EU is really focusing on the role that Turkey um, is playing. You know, I mean, vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. Um, but I think there's a there's a general understanding that Turkey um, has managed to have quite a balanced policy. Um, towards towards Russia and Ukraine. I mean, obviously for Turkey, you know, the the, the situation vis-a-vis -vis the Tatars um, of Crimea has always been uh, an imp important, uh, and the support that Turkey has given them. And also, I don't think there's any you know serious doubt uh, within NATO that Turkey remains you know within the Black Sea um, a very reliable ally. I mean, Turkey has always you know. Um, I mean, Turkey doesn't want to see um, the Black Sea dominated by the Russians. I mean, back in the day when the Russians and Turkey want, weren't getting on very well after that, that, that jet shutdown incident, I think President Erdogan made quite a lot of statements saying, you know, he didn't want that to become um, a, a, Rus a Russian lake. So I think, you know, Turkey will carry out, you know, it's very careful diplomacy, if I can put it that way. Um, to maintain the balance, because if I mean, if you look, I mean, if you look even beyond Ukraine, I mean, Turkey has managed to handle, or President Erdogan has managed to handle his relationship with Russia. Um, I would say very well um, and very carefully, and they've been they've managed to make foreign policy gains in a number of areas where the Russians probably didn't want Turkey um, to make those gains. I mean, obviously in Libya, in Syria, but also in the South Caucasus. So I think they've developed a sort of pragmatic relationship. Um, each one probably now values the other one as much as they probably still really don't like each other that much. Um, but they've managed to compartmentalize, you know, their differences over, you know, what they can gain, what they can gain um, together. So I, obviously the Russians probably aren't that keen on Turkey selling, you know, its, um, its drones to the Ukrainians. But I mean, they will live with it because the Russians have invested a lot in this relationship with Turkey. Um, they want to keep maintaining it because they know 
um, that this closer Russia relationship um, annoys the allies of Turkey, you know, the West, the United States, um, the EU, it drives a wedge in it. And we've seen that, you know, on, on the issues that we know very well, the S-400s and whatnot. But I mean, on the Black Sea, Turkey's always had a careful, a careful approach, and I will imagine it will continue to do so. Uh, thank you. So as we see, uh, the complicated issue only got more complicated, uh, I think, in the recent uh, escalation for both Europe, for Turkey and uh, the other actors. So it means that we have to reflect and try to understand this process uh, even uh, deeper in the coming days. So I would like to thank a lot for uh, uh, Korkmaz and Amanda Paul and the people who follow us from uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook, uh, and different social media. So hopefully uh, we will see a better situation, uh, de-escalated situation in the coming panels. But I think this will uh, keep uh, one of the spots of our uh, discussions uh, in the uh, coming weeks. So hopefully we will see uh, a better uh, you know, situation. So I would like to, uh, as I said, uh, I want to thank all of you.